my last day before I checked out, the night before, I'm laying there and there's this dome of energy, kind of like if you took a, a clear salad bowl, you know, made out of glass or something, and you stuck it over something and you could see through it. Anyway, it was like that, said there was energy that was all, all over the, the bed. I'm in this hospital the bed. There's little sparks of electricity and light like around it. Couldn't see anything outside of it. And at the bottom of the bed, they're presenting himself. I'm here with Reverend Bill McDonald. Rev Bill, you've been here with us once before where you have had a plethora of amazing spiritual experiences that we talked about. And we didn't even have time. There's so much to talk about with you that we didn't even have time to touch on your near death experiences. So first, I want to welcome you back. I'm really excited to have you here with me today and to spend some more time with you. And uh, Thank you for uh, sharing your near-death experiences with us to come back on and spend some more time. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, part of the problem is my my heritage. You know, I'm, I'm Irish as God. And uh, being an old guy, you can't shut us up. I mean, the, the Irish got a gift of gab. I mean, it's, you know, the, how about the Blarney Stone, right? You, so I simply fell in line. My relatives must have kissed it because I've been gifted with the gift of um, of talk anyway so coming back a second time gives us a little deeper water to tread in and to and to talk about truth of the matter is i've been on a eight decade uh journey and every week there's something in my life that is uplifting amazing interesting supernatural mystical or at least unexplained it's not like oh something happened 10 years ago no, something happened ten days ago, or or an hour ago. It's uh, it, it's an ongoing, unfolding, an involving process, and it started when I was young, as far back as I can remember. And so, if we're going to talk about a near death experience, you got to kind of start from the beginning. I've had three near death experiences. Now, as spectacular as that sounds. You have to realize that everybody will have at least one death experience this lifetime. So you know, it's not that big of a deal. You don't want to wish these things along because some death experiences, you don't get to come back and talk about it. So that's what's interesting about near-death experiences. And for whatever reason, this gen generation of, of, of people worldwide Maybe it's because medicine has been updated and there's ways to save people and people come back from comas and, you know, and they got clear, you know, they get your heart going again. There's a lot of things in medical, uh, in the medical world that has probably provided a, a, an avenue, a doorway back to life. But it's interesting in the last decades how many millions, uh, millions of near-death experiences some to a great degree where there's a lot of detail and a lot of memory for people. Some people have a, like, well, maybe it was a dream, they're not sure. But everyone that's had an experience, it's changed them in some way, some degree. Some people really change the whole course of their life. Some people it's really changed their belief systems. Some people, it's answered questions. Some people, it's it's been a, a rallying call for more. They, be, they become seekers, like, well, what's more? Why am I back? What is it? That, all right. So all those things apply to these people that you've had on your show. And some people, it's that's it for their life. It's a, it's a major focal point. Uh, in my life, um, as I said earlier, things happen all the time at many different levels. Uh, it's a ripple. Uh, it has an effect, but it's not like, wow, that changed your life. And no, because I've had even greater spiritual experiences. Uh, and every one of them is an upload. It, it changes your operating system a little bit. So looking at it like that, I, I, I look at people out there and and I see how excited they are to tell their stories. I think what they're really full of 
and I mean full in the greatest beautiful way possible, is love. And and they come back with that full of love experience, and it's like, hey, I got to share this with you. Here's it's they don't know how to share that love, but it's there. They felt it. They felt that spiritual hug. They felt that oneness. They felt that hey, everything's okay. I'm loved, and you're loved. And I think that is the the unfolding message that is common in almost all the people you've interviewed or will interview. There's that level of, well, there was this love experience. And so to the degree of the individual person having the experience, to their degree of enlightenment or understanding or knowledge or faith or uh, ability to receive, they will experience that love and be able to express it in their own way. And I don't think too many people express it exactly the same. I think when I was a kid, I used to think my first near death experience, I go, I go, yeah, I said it was like a, because I had an Italian grandmother, right? I said, it's like having a million Italian grandmas, you know, pinching you and hugging you. And, and you know, it's like, feel a million grandmas hugging you, right? Especially Italian ones, right? You know, so, so that's, that's kind of where it's at. So we'll, we'll take that journey. If you want to take that journey, we will talk about it. I just want to explain to those that are listening, it's an individual experience. And if you hear a hundred of these tales, they're not cookie cutter. They're all uniquely to that personality. You know, there's the sameness is the love, the sameness is most, the majority don't want to come back, <laughs> you know? And some people, it, it's opened up questions of like, why are they here? What the purpose is? To me, it's just been, part of that traveling spiritual show it's like another door opens another download another upgrade uh all right we're ready let's roll so let's go back let's go back in time and space let's go back when i was eight and a half years old i was uh deathly sick when i mean deathly sick i mean i was really 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 bad and uh I had a, a kidney disease. I had lung disease. I had, I even had, well, actually, I had mumps. And that's where it all started. See, people don't have mumps and measles and chickenpox anymore. But mumps was one of those diseases that if you didn't take care of it, it was like the gateway to all the, it would, you know, lead to strep throat. It could lead to pneumonia. It could lead to, to uh, other lung diseases, kidney diseases. It would just transcend the body. So, that's like one of those things that made mumps bad because it was really open to a lot of other stuff. But most people got treated. I didn't get treated. I had the mumps and, and it was all ignored. So it was not being ignored. And I was taken to the county hospital in San Jose, California. And I remember them telling my, my stepfather and telling my mother that you had to bring him in a little late. You know, it's like late. And I'm, I'm strapped to a gurney thinking, what do they mean by late? It's only. It's only eight o'clock at night. Okay, it's just late. I mean, you know, no, it's it's late. I mean, you know, and and they sent him away. I, I'm I'm checked into a hospital at eight and a half years old, first time away from home. And my parents go home. And I'm left to go in the hospital. And that was the first night of of about one year, one year's duration in a county hospital. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a long time for a little kid to be in bed, bed rest, couldn't get up, couldn't go to the, couldn't go shower, couldn't go do nothing. No toys, no TV, no landline phone, let alone a smartphone. Uh, no books, no newspapers, no coloring books, no school, no nothing. And most of the time I was alone, it was, it rarely was there anybody else in the room with me. And so I'd see somebody when they come in and change me, somebody when they gave me a shot and you wake you up at six in the morning and you get nine at night, you, they turn the lights off. So that was my existence for a year. But that first night started off and they took these big, huge needles. And I, I think at the time I thought, well, they must have been big and huge because I'm I was eight and a half, everything looks big. But the needles they put into the back back of you to go to the lungs, they're big. I, I saw pictures. Uh, from medical books and stuff. Oh, they're big. So what's my magic? They're big because it, you know, and they're hollow, so they can suck fluids out. You know, because I thought at the time ago these are huge, right? And they're shoving them into your bath. Anyway, so 
they they drained my lungs because I couldn't breathe, both lungs. And then they put me in, they just said, go to bed. So I'm in this bed by myself, in a room by myself, turn off the lights, by myself, totally in the dark. And then I started feeling this light, L-I-G-H-T. Like I could feel light, like, and I could sense light was getting lighter in the room. And then I was feeling the other kind of light, like lightweight, like feather, like um, floating. Or, so it was kind of like transitioning this heaviness of the body. I was no longer in any pain. I was no longer breathing or sensing I was breathing. I was no longer uh, sensing being alive. I mean, I was floating. I had the sense of of just hovering, you know, just above this body and even though you don't have eyes this spirit this consciousness as you're leaving uh you see i don't know how you see but you i see the body down below me and i'm thinking to myself well i feel sorry for that poor body <laughs> that's that's pretty ragged looking i'm glad i'm not the body and even at eight and a half years old i realized that i'm not the body i'm this thinking consciousness that's observing and noticing and aware of that physical body, but I'm not the body. And so I'm, I'm there and all of a sudden the room goes from this dark, it gets lighter and lighter. And there's like clouds. It's like, you ever flown in an airplane and you fly through clouds, you see the clouds out the windows. And I, I know when I was in Vietnam flying, we had no doors on the helicopter, we'd fly up through clouds and you could, I could reach out and I'm touching the clouds. It was just, and it always brought back memories, good memories. I go, wow, I'm back in the clouds, right? This is kind of, it's kind of angelic, right? You're in the clouds. Anyway, so, and then most people that are talking on your show, they'll talk about, at that point, they're usually kind of showing a glimpse of their life they just had and how their actions affected other people and they got to change things and how they treated people. And, you know, they got a little, life review backwards of how they've lived their life and how it affected people. Well, at eight and a half, there's, there's no going back. There's nothing, right? What do I got? So I look around and I see all these images unfolding on these clouds, just a panorama of people, places, scenes, war, presidential assassination, uh, John F. Kennedy assassination, as it turned out. I'm watching things I had no clue what they were for the future. But I mean, I'm seeing Kennedy getting assassinated. I'm seeing, I'm seeing this woman that I know, this young girl. I'm going, I'm going to meet her. She's going to be my wife. And I see her. She's my wife. I'm having children. I see that. I see myself sitting behind a machine gun on a helicopter in, in, in war. And I see things going on and people shooting at me and stuff. And so I had all kinds of things for the future me. And that was the key, because I realized I'm seeing these things, but I'm seeing me. So if I'm seeing me in the future doing these things or being a part of that history, well, then obviously I, I got to go back. That's the bad news. Oh, I got to go back because I, I, I got this preview of what, what's awaiting me. And what was awaiting me was a lot of painful stuff and, you know, wars, things, stuff. Uh, and some beautiful things like you know, marrying my wife. But uh, so after having that, and then the light gets light and then kind of goes off, and I'm back in my body, and then I feel pain again, and and, and I'm sick again, and there's a part of me that kind of goes, "Wow, I just I just felt good. So I, I felt loved. I felt like." You know, they, they, all the Italian grandmas were hugging me. I mean, it just felt really good. And to be back in a room, a dark room, all alone again was kind of like, uh, yeah, you know, like you got sent to the principal's office. I'm sorry, you don't get to enjoy this anymore. So it was like a disappointment. It was not, it didn't feel like being rewarded to have to go back. I mean, nobody asked me, hey, you got a choice. You want to stay here? It's nice and comfortable. And yeah, no. Nobody asks, it's just, okay, here's what the future holds. Now you got to go back because you have a purpose. 
There's things you have to accomplish. There's your children have to be born. There's grandchildren. There's people that you need to work with. There's a life that you need to live. There's a dharma, a purpose that's awaiting you. And while this was going on, I also saw, which I'll reflect on in the second year death experience, but it comes up in this first one, so they're kind of connected. I see two numbers floating around. I see a, a 29 floating around the clouds. And then the, the two would flip over, you know, kind of go backwards. If you take a two and you fool around that, it looks like a five. So it looked like 29 and it kind of morphs into 59. I'm going, oh, that's weird, you know. So when I woke up and I spent the next one year in the hospital, had visitors like on Sundays, about 10 minutes at a time, once a week, you know, and I said Christmas, and, you know, Easter, my birthday, no gifts, no, no, no candy, no, no nothing. It was just, so I, I say that, and some people go, oh, how sad. And I go, no, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And let me explain. I had an opportunity to spend a, 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 a most valuable year of learning and training. I was totally isolated. I had no outside stimulus of, all, of anything, television, radio, music, nothing. It was just me every day laying in bed thinking. So I started making up my own meditation techniques. I started going inward. I started visualizing things and I started seeing, and I was seeing myself because at that age, my mother read to me and I had read uh, this story from the book Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. And those that are familiar with him, he started the Self-Realization Fellowship in America in Europe and around the world. And he was this yogi who came in 1920 to America and in 1946, the year I was born, he wrote this book, Autobiography of a Yogi, which is that same book that, you know, Steve Jobs was given everybody and, and the Beatles used to give people, George Harrison, everybody was pushing that. Same book that's been around for, I'm 78 years old. It's been around 78 years, right? But there was a story in that book about a, a great avatar, which at that age, I wasn't even sure what that meant. But there was this, great spiritual being that appeared to a guru, Larry Masha, in the Himalayan foothills in a cave. And beautiful story on how this great one came back to teach this guru this ancient lost technique of meditation called Kriya Yoga. Because it was originally only taught to the highest seekers. But in the course of time, there was less and less high seekers. So the general public needed something, they weren't getting it. And so it came back and, and the dispensation was that it could be taught to, to honest seekers. If you're a seeker and you want it, teach it. And so I read that. It was just this beautiful story, this experience in this cave for you know 10 days, whatever it was. And I thought, I want to go to that cave someday. I'm going to go to that cave. So that's what I was thinking about when I was in the hospital for a year. I want to go to that cave. I want to I want to have my own personal experience there. All right. So little did I know at least on the this reality level. Apparently I knew someplace. But exactly 50 years later, exactly 50 years later, I end up in India. I've been trying to get to India when I'm a teenager, hitchhiking around Europe, bumming around the South Pacific, going to Vietnam, going to you know, Singapore, Malaysia, and Japan, but all these different places. I can never quite get to India. It's never happened. Then I got married, you got kids, and, and you got obligations. You just can't pack up and go to India. So when I retired from the Postal Service, I finally had an opportunity. And now I was 58 and a half. Oh, it's 50 years later. That's eight and a half. I'm 58 and a half. And I find myself in India. I find myself going to this cave. I have this fantastic, crazy experience there, which relates to this second near-death experience. I get there and I hike up. We get lost. I, 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 my heart is in really bad shape. 
I get to the cave, beautiful experiences and things happen there. I'm trying to condense the story down so we have time to tell three, three stories here. But when I leave the cave, I'm disoriented and because uh, I'm having a heart attack, you know, and I'm dehydrated and I'm, uh, I'm not doing well. And so I'm wandering around and lost in the Himalayas. And I, I'm standing on the edge of a cliff. The cliff goes down about 30 feet a drop. Now, that would have been pretty bad, but I'm lucky that it drops down like 8, 10, 12 feet, and there's a little outcropping of a couple of feet, maybe, and then it goes down, and there's another two or three feet, you know, so I, I can bounce three or four times, you know, unconscious, I can bounce, boom, 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 down the hill, and then I ended up on this boulder, because I'm staying there looking down, and then just my head is like, and my heart's going, boom, felt like somebody, a couple of hands were just grabbing my heart and going, you know, I'm tearing it apart, and I just collapsed, just blanked out. And next thing I know, I'm I'm laying on this boulder, big, huge boulder, at the bottom of this ravine, and I feel myself leaving again. I go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, 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 I remember this feeling. It's the same feeling I had when I was eight and a half. Now I'm 50 years later, and to the date. <laughs> I can't prove it because I can't know the exact dates, but in my mind, it was like the exact, this is 50 years later, right? 50 years later. And there I am having the same exact experience again. I'm lifting up. I'm separating from the physical body and there's no more pain, not breathing. I'm not, not discomfort. I'm not uncomfortable, nothing. I'm just floating. And I'm up in the air, lack of a better term. And I'm 30 feet up at least because I'm looking at my buddy, looking down at me, down at the body down there. And he's looking down. And I'm going, hey, 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 no, I'm, I'm here, right? But you, know, you don't see me, of course. And, but I'm seeing him with his concern looking at this body laying down there. This body just laying on a rock all twisted, you know, laying there. And I'm going, oh, this is all right. And I... I had a reunion with that love and it was, it was once again, embracing me. And, and that's the whole thing of these experiences. If there's nothing else you remember, because there's a lot you forget. If there's nothing else you, you, you remember, it's that. It's, when I say an embrace, I mean, a lover would never have a greater hold on you. And it was just every, fiber every cell vibrates and, and you don't have any cells you don't have any fibers you don't have a body but you're vibrating anyway and you go and so you don't even think about that i tell them the story now i'm thinking well what's vibrating you don't you don't have a body you're just this filament of consciousness floating around right and no no attachment to this body all over all. i'm looking at the body once again I look down the body, and, and again, look is not the right word. I, I sense, I see without eyes, without turning my head. I, I'm, I'm aware of this body down there, and the body's all twisted, and I'm going, I'm sure glad that's not me, because that looks painful. That guy's really hurting. That's, you know, that's, that's not a beautiful sight, but I knew that. Again, I go, that's not me. I am, I am this filament that's floating in this consciousness of love. That's who I am, not that. And so I'm enjoying this with, I go, well, you know what? If, if, if this is how I die, if this is how I leave the body, I'm going, no complaints. This is all right. <clears throat> you know, 50 years later, I finally get my trip to India. I get to go to Babaji's cave that I dreamt about for a year in a hospital. Because then a year in a hospital, I visualize going to this cave. I imagine going to the cave. I imagine going to this cave and, and, and being there, and then all of a sudden, there I am. And uh, so it was all right. I'm going, yeah. And then I look, look again, look down. When I say look down, I mean my awareness is downward. I'm focused on what's happening down there. And on my body, I see this large, huge cobra crossing my ankles and calves and on my shoes, my sandals. And it's just slithering over my body. And I'm going, wow, oh, I, I, I love that snake. And there was this 
there was no fear. It wasn't like, oh my God, there's a snake on me. It was like, oh God, I love that snake. I want to touch it. I want to hold it. And I was so overwhelmed with love for that snake that it was like some divine angel paramedic came down and goes, Ch -ch -ch. okay, Bill, clear. And it's like I got jump started and I jump up from the rock, take a breath. And I go, wow, I'm breathing. And I just, I start grabbing the snake and I'm lifting it up. And I got my hands like this. And I notice the fingers aren't touching like this. And I'm holding the snake because I can't get my fingers to touch. There's four or five inches between the fingers and the thumbs on the bottom. So the thing is at least that big around. So when I say big snake, that's a big body. I don't care anybody. Says, that's a big snake, right? I can't see the front of it or the end of it because it's going from grass across me into grass. So I never saw how long it was. It could have been seven feet, could have been 15 feet, could have been a king cobra. I have no idea. But the Irish in me tells the story and thinks, yeah, it had to be a king cobra. It had to be 15, 15, 16 feet. It had to be, it could have been seven or eight. I have no idea. But in my mind, in my heart, it was huge. It was beautiful. And I just kept grabbing onto it. Like I wanted to hug it. I'm trying to hold it and lift it up. We're talking about, you know, fangs and a head. I mean, a real cobra. And I, I just I just keep grasping it. And I chase it. And my friend is going crazy. He's yelling at me from the mountain. He sees me wandering around down here chasing a snake. Phil, what are you, what are you doing? And, and, and it slithers through the grass and I follow it in my, my sandals with no, no socks, right? So I got bare feet. And nothing going to stop a bite. And there's a little trickle of a waterfall. I mean, the trickle was, oh, this microphone is bigger than the waterfall. It was like a few inches around, just a little water coming down. It was about eight or nine feet tall. And behind this little trickle of water was a little cavern big enough for the snake. And the snake went through the water, circled around in a coil. I'm watching it. I'm just staring. I'm mesmerized with watching the snake just curl. And then the head comes up and the little tongue comes out, right? And it's just looking at me and I'm looking at it and I'm like two or three feet from it, just sticking my head right by the water watching this, right? And we just have this thing, this very loving thing. It's truly, truly beautiful. And uh, a lot more stuff happened and there's a journey getting back. There's all kinds of stuff. I'm kind of skipping over that because my third year death experience is really out there, totally different. But a normal, rational person, meaning not me, would say, oh, you just had a heart attack. You fell 30 foot off a cliff. What's the first thing you could do when you get back to civilization? You got to go to a doctor and get a checkup, right? I mean, you know, a woman would. You know, men, yeah, back, I'm breathing. It's, you know, nothing's, nothing's broken. It's still all working, right? So I'm there October, November. I get back time for Thanksgiving. I ain't got time to go to the doctor. I'm home. Uh, I do in December. In December, all of a sudden, I have a big lump on my spiritual eyes, like a big hard thing. And I go in and they go, you got cancer between your eyes. I'm thinking, wait a minute. I go to India looking for this great spiritual experience. And I come back and I got cancer in the spiritual eye. It's all cleaning it out. And you're going to take it out for me? And they looked at me like I was crazy. Well, yeah, we're just going to cut it out. I don't know about the rest of the stuff. I go, no, no, it's okay. So they they cut it out. And I get all these stitches there in this big hole. And I and I it, it was kind of symbolic. It was like at that part of my life, I was cleaning these things out of my spiritual. It was like the spiritual cancers were coming out, right? Both. So then a couple months later, after collapsing about six times in my house, I finally decided to drive myself to the doctor, which at that point, it seems like a rational thing to do. I tell my wife, I'm, I'm just driving to the doctor. and I'm having a full-blown heart attack at the time. I don't tell her that. I get in my, my pickup truck five-speed on the floor. You know, I'm going through the gears and everything. We drive seven miles. I pull into the ER. There's no parking lot spaces left in the ER, so I park about a mile away. I walk back. I have a heart attack. Come in because you can't come in through the ambulance part. you got to go into the door because you're ambulatory. So you didn't come with an ambulance, so you got to stand in line. Stand in line, there's 18 people in line. 15 minutes later, I'm at the front of the line. And 
what's the first question that they ask you? This is Kaiser, probably the same in all hospitals. I'm there because I got a problem. I'm ER, presenting myself in ER, right? What's the first thing they ask? Not what's wrong with you. That'd been logical, right? Why are you here? First thing, you got insurance. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then they still don't ask. Take these clipboards, take these clipboard, go back there, fill out these six pages, and then get in that line over there. Still haven't asked me why I'm there. So I fill them out and get in the other line. There's about eight people. I finally get up to the front of the line and she give me the clipboard, just clipboard. Page three on the clip. Page three on the clipboard has a little space that says, Why are you here? Not the first question. Page three. Right. And it says, uh, I put in there, I wrote in there, I said, I'm having a full, I literally I said, I'm having a full blown heart attack. So I wrote. And she laughed. She goes, Yeah, we'll be the judge of that. She goes, How'd you get here? And I told her, and I told her where I parked. And I, you know, I gave her all that stuff. She goes, Yeah. Yeah, okay, sit down. Takes out her stethoscope, and then she's going. Next thing I know, I see these, I don't know what color they were. In my mind, it was like the blue light special at Kmart. Lights are going. She's got some code something, code black, code blue, code red. I don't know what it was, but it was some code, you know. Next thing you know, they're bringing out this gurney. They put me on a gurney. They strap me down. She says, sir, you're having a heart attack. And I go, yeah. Just like, just as calm as I am right now. I go, yeah, that's why I came in. She goes, no, no, sir, you're really having a heart attack. And I go, yeah. Like, surprise, you know. So I go in there and the doctor comes in there and he wants to operate, wants to do all kinds of crazy stuff. And so one of the only times in my life I ever complained, because I never, I never complain about what life gives me. I usually, I'm accepting whatever happens. So it's just supposed to happen. It's all right. It's all good. But I, I look at the doctor and I'm going, I said, I said, I said, this is, something's wrong here. I said, you know, oh, I said, 50 years ago, I suspected I was having some health issues in the future. So I, I changed my diet. I, you know, I became a vegetarian. You know, so like eating really good. I don't, I don't do sugar. I don't do caffeine. I don't smoke, no nicotine. Uh, I don't do alcohol. I don't do drugs of any kind. Uh, I'm pretty straight. I do yoga and meditate and all this stuff. And I go, so I don't get it. How am I having a heart attack? And he looks at me. Remember the 29, 59? And he looks at me and he goes, he says, well, looking at your chart and your genetics, he says, you're lucky you didn't die at 29. Instead of, and he looks down and he says, oh, your birthday's in a few, couple of weeks. Instead of 59 coming up, 29, 59. So had I not, Taking that health food route and avoided all that stuff, 29 was probably the distant time to go. But now I'm looking at me thinking, well, now I still got 59 looking there. And then 59, uh, I just had asked a couple of weeks before then, we we're having a high school reunion that, that, that uh, fall coming up. And I had a questionnaire, I said, who'd you want to meet in the class, the class reunion? So I want to meet my, my old buddy, Paul O'Brien, you know, because we were both born on March 16th, 1946. We we're both born in St. Mary's Health Hospital in San Francisco, about an hour apart. And uh, we discovered each other years later, 40 miles away in another town and another school. But anyway, it was interesting. We found out, oh, we were next to each other in bassinets. Our, our mothers were next to each other and sharing a room, right? Was kind of, but I thought, well, if there's anything to astrology, right? Here's a guy that Heavy meat eater, smoke, three or four packs a day, uh, alcohol, gambling, didn't meditate, didn't eat veggies. I mean, all totally opposite of me. And then my class, when I asked him about it, he said, oh, Paul died. He didn't make 59. He didn't make 59. He died. I go, oh. So I'm there thinking, Okay, we got the same astrology chart. I took care of myself, but I didn't die at 29, but here I'm at 59 and he's dead. So to make a long story short, a spoiler alert, I, I survived. I'm here, I'm here to, again, and I was alive a few years later so I could have another experience. But, but basically the two and the nine, because when I, when I had that, it was like, I took it as a warning. 
like, because when I got out of the hospital one year when I was a child, I became a vegetarian, but I was the only one in my family. And I'm telling you, the 1950s, early 50s, there was nothing to eat at a fast food place that was vegetarian. There's nothing in a store unless you just eat, eat vegetables, or cereal, and rice. I mean, you know, all the carbs, you could, that's, that's what got to me, the carbs. You know, didn't realize carbs weren't necessarily good for your heart. Anyway, so it was my being alerted from having this forward vision and seeing these two numbers, even though I didn't know what those numbers meant, my, my higher self must have, because I came out and I made sure I didn't drink, I didn't do alcohol, I didn't do all those different things. I knew that it was a delicate balance with my body. And when I was in high school, uh, 1963, uh, I go to my high school principal and, and I tell him, I say, hey, look, the president's going to get shot next week in, in Dallas. He's going to kill the president because I had, I had that vision when I was a kid, right? Yeah, yeah, Bill, yeah, sure. And then, of course, it happens, right? But it was exactly like I told everybody, except the only difference between my version of what happened and history's version, uh, and I've been told I'm wrong by Facebook told me I was wrong. I got labeled, you know, I mean, wrong about talking about the Kennedy assassination because in my version, there was more than one shooter. So obviously, I must be wrong because the government says there was only one shooter, just Harvey or Lee Ball. So, so, but taking that aside, that maybe I'm spreading conspiracies, that's what I dreamt. That's what I saw. That's what I told people. That's what happened. But everything that happened in Vietnam, I saw coming. Uh, major events in my life, I saw happening. So it was like deja vu for like 50 years. So I, I knew it was, and then all of a sudden, after I have this experience, 50 years later, it's like, oh, now we're new territory. Now I'm like everybody else. I, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the next 50 years is going to bring or if I got 50 years. But as it turns out, my intuitive ability, I, I still know stuff. But it was that initial thing like, well, okay, made it to, so then that was 2004. Now here's where the story gets deeper and, 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 and we have to have a background story on this. Because in 2010, after several more trips to India, I end up staying in an ashram outside of, Mum, uh, let's see, where was it? Outside of Pune. And uh, the guru that was there took me one day and he goes, Bill, I want you to go to Pune. And I want you to go get a naughty palm leaf reading done. And I laughed. I go, I don't need no fortune teller. I'm thinking palm. He's going to read my palm or, or leaf like tea leaves. I, what's a naughty? You're naughty. Where's a naughty energy thing? I had no clue what he was talking about. I, go, I have no idea what you're talking about. I said, I don't believe in that stuff. He says, yeah, but it believes in you. I want you to go get it done. And, then I, and, I, and I want you to, you know, uh, Get the reading, and in the reading, I will, uh, I'm sending a note to the, the reader. I want him to tell you what the worst sin you ever did. I go, really? Okay. I said, well, how do they do these? So he explains to me that 2,500 to 5,000 years before, okay, before Jesus, these great rishis, these holy men, these spiritual beings, starting with Agashi. Uh, and they channeled, just like channelers do today, I guess, they channeled people in the future, and they had these scribes sitting around who would write on a palm leaf, and they take the palms off of just the hardwood, and they'd cut them, and, they, and they'd carve in this green palm leaf uh, the future in a strange language and everything. Uh, and then when that person was supposed to get that reading, they would come in and somehow they would find this leaf for him and they had millions of them, would find this thing and they would come at the right time and it'd be there for them. And I'm listening to the thing thinking, yeah. I said, how'd they find it? They said, well, it's your thumbprint. I go, sure, okay, fine. And then they explained to me that there's 108 different indentations and lines and, and you know, 108 different possible personalities from your thumbprint. Like the Zodiac, you got 12 signs, Pisces, Leo, Aries, whatever, right? Certain types of people. Well, with a thumb, there's 108 
types of people. So, so I'm thinking, okay, well, if you got millions of these, it still doesn't narrow it down, right? So, and then they've taken these piles of these, they call bundle, they got them all together, and they're spread out over India in people's homes, ancient homes and libraries and temples, and, I mean, about at least 20 different locations. So even if you, you were looking for it, and there's millions of them, it could be in 20 different cities, at least in India. If it wasn't destroyed or stolen by the British, when the British were there, they stole a few and some got burnt. And, you know, so they're not exactly taken care of like in a library of Congress with reference numbers to just spread out. So I'm told all that, I'm thinking, okay. So the idea is you go into this reading and you and you write down your name. No, not your name. You, you write down an initial of any kind, just initials. So, you know, I put down W, but I'll go by William. I just put W next to my thumbprint, right thumbprint. And I didn't know at the time. So I, I the guru sent me, so I'm just going to sit here and wait for they get the, you know, the bundle. It could have been anywhere in the country. I could have been sitting there for a year. I didn't know. I mean, if you send me here, I'm, I'm going to stay until I get it done, right? So anyway, a couple hours later, they, they found the bundles, and you, you, they bring you in there, and, 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 the, and the instructions is, they give you all these questions. Your job is to only answer yes or no. Don't give any hints, no clues. And if you answer like 40 questions correct, then that's, your, that's yours, and then they, they go from there. So I go in there, and they, they went through six, and they were kind of me, but not me. And so he finally goes, intuitively, he says the seventh leaf here, the seventh one, we believe is yours. I think I'll be fine. I'm kind of like, yeah, sure. So he gets in, he goes, your last, your first name is four letters long. I go, yeah, okay, I go by Bill. I don't go by William. But I don't explain that to him. I just say yes, yes or no. I go, yes, okay, Bill, in my mind. And he goes, and it starts with B. I go, yes. And he says, it's Bill. I go, yes. And he says, and your father's name was exactly the same as you, meaning he's dead, and you have the same exact name he does. Well, I'm junior. Obviously, it's exactly the same as mine. And then he gives me my mother's name, gives me my wife's name, the birth order of my children, uh, my whole background, 40 questions, boom, 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 everything is there. And then he goes, and your birth date is March 16th, 1946. I'm thinking, okay, maybe, maybe you could take a guess. There's 366 possible days, count leap year. Uh, you know, maybe you got within the decade of my age, you know, I don't know. Do I look 78? I don't know. At that time I was younger. But he says, but we don't know the time. <laughs> they don't know the time. These guys aren't that good, right? He says, we think it's between like 105, 110, and 125 in the morning. And what they didn't know when I was born, uh, they were giving my mother an enema in the hospital. And she was telling them she was going to deliver. And they go, no, 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 they give her an enema. And she's got a bedpan. And of course, she was right. I delivered right into a bedpan head first. And I had a mouthful of crap. And that's how I started my life off. You know, no silver spoon in the mouth, just a bunch of crap. Anyway. But the doctor wasn't there, so they kind of held me kind of in a bench, you know, and, and they sent for the doctor. The doctor finally gets because he wants to get paid for the delivery. And he goes, oh, when did when, when the kid come out? And they go, the nurses go, well, between 105 and 110 and 125, we're not sure. So he took a guess, and the guess he took was exactly the same guess that these guys took, you know, like about 115 or 110, whatever it was. And they put it down, and I go, wow. Anyway, long story short, that was the reading that I was going to pay him. I thought that was the reading. They said, no, no, now we're going to do the reading. So they take me upstairs six hours later. I get a, a Vedic chart and they read your, your that life that they just nailed. They made a bunch of predictions about things that were going to happen in the next 10 years. Everything happened, but one, that was my death. I was told in 2020, this is 2010, in 2020, if you travel to India, you'll die. Do not leave in India. So, of course, 2020, I put a mask on, stayed home, right? I didn't go anywhere. Anyway, so, but they told me a couple other things that I was going to come back the next year, 2011, 
I was going to go to this Shiva temple in Southern India. And when I got there, there was a, a hill. I'm going to walk up that hill two, three, four hours, whatever. They weren't even sure I was going to walk up this hill. And when I get up the top, there's, I'm going to see a clearing with all these rishis, the guys that wrote all these things. All the rishis will be there sitting around the sacred fire. And you will join them, but you'll have no questions for them because you know everything they know. I thought, well, that's a nice fairy tale. Yeah, okay. So I thought I was actually going to take a physical trip to India, right? And then they made another prediction about Babaji, which I'll discuss after we talked about the near death here. So all year, I come to India in 2011, but I have a heart attack, major heart attack. And I'm sent home, so I didn't get a chance. I couldn't go to the temple or nothing else, right? I said, well, there's, there's, there's a prediction that ain't going to make it. So I end up in, in California, and I'm, I'm open, I have open-heart surgery scheduled. Um, I'm laying early in the morning, butt naked, on a, on a metal cold metal operating table with the thinnest of sheets on it. And they're getting ready to do this thing. They got to, you know, so I asked, I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, we're going to, uh, uh, he says, I'm going to, I'm going to cut you. He's got this thing. I'm going to cut your chest open. And then he's got these things look like prunes, like, like pruners that you use for a, a fruit tree, you're cutting branches on a big tree, you know, pruners, you know, like, I'm going to cut your ribs. I mean, he's very, you know, very, dramatic you know and then he got this thing he says i got this thing and i'll put it to, to chest expander and it's going to hold your chest bones or you know the rib cage open and i'm I, I just wanted the basics i mean i didn't want details right so he's giving me all the details he says you know and then i'm slicing here and i'm thinking your artery in from your leg you know we're gonna you know we're gonna sew that on to your heart well we gotta stop your heart and we're gonna put you on a heart lung machine it's going to pump oxygen and blood into you so we're stopping your lungs and we're stopping your heart. He says, basically, we're killing you. And he thought that was funny. I go, whoa, 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 my heart's not breathing. I, I, my heart's not beating. I'm not breathing. He goes, yeah. He says, like, you're dead. I said, don't worry about it. As long as we got electricity, the machine will work good. Which I go, what a thought to have, right? I'm going, he goes, well, we haven't had that problem before. You should be all right. I said, well, am I going to feel anything? And he says, well, with a small amount of people, they feel something because when the heart lung machine, we have to drastically cut back on the anesthesia. We can't overdo you or we lose you, right? So it's so yeah. So he says people come back say they felt something. It's like cash, don't worry about it. Then boom, gives me a shot. Next thing you know, boom, I'm gone. Now here's a an experience that is not. I'm not floating out of the body. I'm not an astral body with an attachment of some kind. I'm not a spiritual body. I'm not an angel body. I'm not a body in life. I go, boom, out of that body. The body's still there on the table. And I'm standing in India outside that temple I was supposed to visit that year, that month. I recognize that, you know, the, the, I, this is it. It's a Shiva temple. This must be it, right? And, of course, I'm, I'm a little nervous. So I look around, I'm thinking, well, when I was on the operating table, I didn't have any clothes on. Do I have clothes? I have clothes on. So this is my 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 experience. I'm very modest. So I'm, I'm dressed, but I can feel the sunshine. I can feel people bumping into me. I can feel people breathing on me. Uh, I was a body. There was no astral projection. There was no, it was not a vision. I mean, it's the real deal. I'm walking. I'm bumping into people, and I see the I see the hillside, and I go, "Hey, look! It's an eight-hour operation. I might as well walk. Let's take a walk." I go, "What else to do, right? I don't have a watch. I don't know what time it is. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm supposed to walk uphill. This is the place I'm going to walk uphill." So I walk up, who knows how long, and I get to the top, and there's all the rishis, the great rishis, you know, with all their funny-looking hair. I mean, they look like they're from Jamaica, you know, with the funny hair, you know, and the beards, and I mean, wild wow, group of people. And then with them is the guy that the guru that sent me to get my reading. He's there standing like this, looking at me. I go there and I sit down and I don't have a single question for any of these, any of these guys. Nothing. It's like, yeah, uh, I know. I know everything I'm supposed to know. It's just like, well, even though I can't remember it right now, 
but I knew then I'm there. I knew it all. And of course, my wife says, yeah, you're always a know-it-all. What What's different? Anyway, so I'm standing there and these guys are sitting around the fires on rocks and on logs and stuff. And I look at the guru and the guru goes, you can skip a few beats, but don't give up heart. I go, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. You know, I've been in so much pain and so much suffering. And it was like my ninth or 10th or 11th heart attack at this stage of my life. I mean, I'm, I'm always having heart attacks, right? So it was like, it was, this was really an uncomfortable experience and that went through a lot. And it was like, yeah, if I check out, it's okay. I mean, it wasn't, even, I love my family, I love life, but if like I checked out, it was okay. I didn't mind, it was a good time to go. And, uh, and then once again, the clouds, remember the clouds? The clouds are back. I go, there's a theme here, right? There's a theme, I'm feeling loved. And I hear this beautiful feminine voice, this angelic voice, the only way to explain it. And this angelic voice sounds like a, sounds like a, a, a young woman of like 22, 24, you know, young, young, beautiful. I, mean, I can't see her, but the voice just sounds just amazingly sacred, spiritual, just like you would picture a, an angel and goes, Bill, just let it go. Let the heart go. You've done everything you're supposed to do. You don't owe anybody anything. Come. We'll give you bliss. We'll give you joy. We'll give you peace. No pain, no suffering. Come join us. Get a beautiful rest. You've earned it. You owe nobody nothing. And the guru keeps to interrupt it and going, Bill, skip a few beats, but don't give a part. And he keeps going on this stuff. And I said, well, I go, yeah, well, she's promised me peace, bliss, joy. All these beautiful things. What are you going to promise me? And he goes, I promise you more pain and suffering than you ever had in your life. I go, what? He goes, yes. I go, why do I want to endure that? He says, because you've had pain in the past, but you've used your magical, mystical abilities from that you've learned from practicing yoga and, and previous lives and other stuff that, I mean, you can endure all the pain in the world. It never bothers you. The moment's gone. You've blocked it out mentally. It's just, he says, no more. That gift is gone. You're going to come back and have to learn a technique to handle pain so you can teach others how to handle pain. And I go, why? And then he just points to the clouds. And in the clouds, there's this panorama of sea of faces. I've got ocean faces, thousands of faces, men, women, Asian, black, Hispanic, white, uh, even a couple of dogs and some cats and a few birds. It was weird, but it was just all these faces going by and all from all over the world. And he goes, because if you don't come back, these people won't get the gift that you're going to give them. And you don't owe them anything but you won't get the gift that you're supposed to give them. I said, like what? He goes, could be just a smile, could be hope, could be healing, could be love, could be a hug. It could be just giving them courage, could be safe. It's everyone's a different story, but they're waiting for you. And I'm going, dad. <laughs> anyway, that wasn't good enough because he's promised to make pain, right? And he keeps going, you can skip a few beat, but you don't give a part, right? So all of a sudden, I feel hands inside my body, like something's going on, right? What was happening on the operating table? And all of a sudden, I'm at that stage on the operating table where they're going, Ch -ch -ch, clear, where they're restarting the heart, right? Cage is still open, but they're restarting the heart. And all of a sudden, boom, and boom, I land on the operating table, and I'm in such great, great, great pain. I mean, there was no lie. Pain was awaiting me. It was painful. And then I, I'm laying there and I got a tube down my throat and it's taped. I got tape over my eyes. Uh, and I'm laying there and I'm strapped. I can't move. I can't talk. And I'm trying to tell the doctor, but I can't. It's only in my head. I'm screaming, going, hey, I feel everything. Hey, you know, hey, hey come on. You know? And I hear the what I thought was the anesthesiologist talking to this main surgeon. The anesthesiologist is going, hey, doc, he says, uh, I, I think that I, I think this patient is uh, 
the anesthesia just wore off. I think he's feeling it all. And the doctor goes, I don't worry about it. We only got another 45 minutes. And I'm going, what? <laughs> 45 minutes? I mean, that was the longest 45 minutes of my entire life. And I didn't, I couldn't even watch a clock. I mean, I'm 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 total darkness, right? I can't scream, I can't talk. So and, and then we went on there putting the, the rib cage back and then wiring it, and I'm feeling the wires wrapping around there and tightening it. I feel the staples going into the skin and stitches going in the holes and stitches and, and all this stuff. And then I get through and uh, and I wasn't improving for the next two or three weeks at five blood transfusions. I was, I was, I was kept losing it. But every time I'd go to sleep or drift off, I was back on the mountaintop or the hill and had that same conversation, the same vision of other people. And the guru kept saying, you can skip a few beats, but don't give a part. And I kept going, go back. Go, look, I, I'm ready to go because it's painful. I mean, I'm feeling everything. So I'm there about three weeks afterwards and they're taking me down like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night for emergency procedure because I'm filling up with blood fluid and phone the landline next to the bed rings and they got me a gurney. I'm on a gurney. And I go, no, I can't. No, no, you can't. no I said, I got to answer the phone. Answer the phone is this guru guy. And he goes, Bill, this is Gornoff in India. Yeah, I go, how many Gornoffs do I know? I'm glad you pinpointed it to India, right? That's... And then he goes, you can skip a few beats, but don't give a part. And I go, what? What'd you say? He says, you can skip a few beats, but don't give a part. I go, what, 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 what? And then he goes, and I, I'm still fighting him, right? And he goes, you know, I just sent a hundred people up to the temple and I told them to pray, for, meditate, but I told them that I was going to heal you. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> so anyway, that's how that conversation. So I go, should I get to the hospital? So I get home out of the hospital. So my last day before I checked out the night before I'm laying there and there's this dome of energy, kind of like if you took a, a clear salad bowl, you know, made out of glass or something and you stuck it over something and you could see through it. And anyway, it was like that said, it was energy. And it was all, all over the, the bed. I'm in this hospital the bed. There's little sparks of electricity and light like around it. Couldn't see anything outside of it. And at the bottom of the bed, they're presenting himself as Babaji, this great master, this avatar that was there in the cave, right, that I read about as a kid, who I've seen prior. It's another whole story if you want to know about Babaji. So it wasn't my first, it wasn't my first dance with him. So there he is. He's got long black hair. He looks about in his 20s. His skin is shiny like he's wet. He's, he's got bare feet. He's got no shirt on. But this is my, my experience, my vision. He's got a pair of Levi's on. He's in America. Come on. So he, he stands at the end of the bed and his hand's reaching over. We're talking about seven, eight feet away. But it, you know, it made sense at the time. He's, he's dabbing uh, oil and, 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 and pouring water on my head. And he's chanting some language. That I had no idea what it was, but I was just feeling great, great, great love. Great love. And I thought, nobody's ever going to believe me. It's a beautiful experience, but it's probably just drugs. Nobody will know, but it's beautiful. I feel loved and I'm grateful for it. And blah, blah, blah. All right. Next day I'm home. My daughter comes by and she says, oh, she says, uh, hey, did you, uh, Ryan, this old neighbor, David Ryan, uh, he went to visit you in the hospital that, you know, yesterday, the day before you left. Uh, he wanted to talk to you. And I go, no, he didn't. She says, oh, yeah, no, he was there. No, he, he wasn't. I didn't see him. She says, no, he was there in the morning and, and, and he was looking at you and he, he had some crazy Indian, young Indian guy with long black hair, no shirt on, no shoes on, pouring oil and stuff and chanting on you. And he thought it was funny and he was laughing and he didn't want to embarrass you, so he left. So I told my daughter, I said, here's what happened. So that experience that I thought nobody else saw and that it wasn't real, maybe, somebody witnessed it that didn't even believe it. And it described exactly what happened. So that was my third near death experience. It's much deeper. It would take three more hours to say the whole imminent details of it, but 
you ain't got enough time on this channel. I was trying to keep you within your time limits, so you're pretty close. But that was it. But it was like each experience was totally different, totally different lessons. And when I finished my second year death experience, remember what the experience with the with the uh, the cobra. Right after that, about a couple of weeks later, if you got time for a five minute story, sure. Uh, I didn't know what the connection was with cobras, so I find out somebody tells me in one of these ashrams, "Oh, the cobra that represents the kundalini energy in your spine, and you know, and Lord Shiva, and you know, and it's all the spiritual stuff about the cobra." I go, okay, that's, I didn't know any of that, but I just felt love. So I'm in the desert. I, I go to this temple. Uh, in this courtyard, there's a woman, older lady. She's got a basket of cobras, and she's got a stick, a little short stick, and she's beating the basket, and the cobras are getting mad, and they're, they're all coming up, you know, you know, trying to bite the air and everything. And I see her doing it, and I, I go running over towards it. I'm thinking, what, what are what are you doing, right? What, what, what are you doing, these beautiful animals? So I find myself standing right over the basket. The basket's between my legs. I mean, my crouch is right above the, the basket with all these snakes are coming up right by my pockets and my belt and by my, I mean, there's just six, eight snakes coming up at me. One crawls into my T-shirt, circles around, it's under my shirt, crawled up. And the other one crawls up my arm. Next thing I know, it's, it's wrapped two or three wraps around my neck and it's out to the side like this. And I look over and it's about an inch at the most, three quarters of an inch, right from my eyeball with the two big fangs. And I'm yelling at this lady and I'm making fast movements and all the stuff you're not supposed to do, right? And I turn, I look at that and then I feel my eyelash go, the tongue, a butterfly kiss from a cobra, right? The tongue is, my hitting my lash that's how close it is right and i turn and i'm mesmerized open mouth to this cobra with the fangs and i just i don't know how long it was when i went inside this cobra it was like this dark cave it was like a cavern and i just found myself my consciousness was just flowing inside this cobra and it was like this embrace of the darkness inside the cobra was just beautiful. And I, and I don't know, people were talking, there was a crowd around. I have no clue what was going on. I was oblivious to everything except the oneness in the darkness with this cobra. I just felt love. And then one around my shirt, you know, sticking its head out underneath, you know, the t-shirt. And then and this one's on the neck. So finally I get through and and the lady's mad at me because she wants me to pay for handling her snakes, you know, of course. Anyway, but it was an interesting, I've had several instances with cobras, but there's something about cobras as part of this spiritual experience and journey. Um, anyway, so that's my three near death experiences, and they're totally different. You'll have you'll have a hundred people eventually on your show telling their stories, and none of them will have anything matching what I went through. Theirs are different, mine are different, but these are each separately different from each other in this lifetime, three totally different. In 2009, when I went back to India, I stayed at this ashram and all the rooms were kind of primitive, they were all there. And only one room had any kind of artwork on the wall. None of them had anything on the wall. So the guru goes, I got a special room for you. I didn't know what he was talking about. I go in there. And there is Lord Shiva, a picture of Lord Shiva over this desk in the room with a cobra wrapped around his neck doing this with his tongue out, right? And I'm going, that's the cobra, right? That's the cobra. So, and then he told me, I was sitting around a campfire, that because I, I questioned the whole thing about cobra, but the whole thing about the cobra is that represents the, the spiritual kundalini energy in your spine. And as you evolve spiritually and you meditate deeper, this energy gains when it just this, this coil just vibrates and we just so uh, there's other people that give you greater meanings. I'm not much of a scholar. I experience things. I don't study things. I don't question things. 
I'm more childlike. I go, oh, that's cool. You know, it's neat. If I never understood it, it's, I'm just as happy I had the experience. But I think that when it comes to near-death experiences, as varied as people are, that's as varied as experiences will be. But they will match your belief system. I mean, if you're a, if you're a devout Methodist or a Jehovah Witness or a Hindu or a Buddhist or, or Jewish or Catholic, you will have something that relates to your beliefs because it makes it easier comfortable. You know, the divine will make you comfortable. You'll have an experience. You'll learn your lessons through your own system. So I, I think that uh, around the world, people have slightly different experiences based on their own belief systems. But it's all the same energy of love. And what you bring back and remember may be slightly different than what you actually experienced. It's like trying to remember a dream, but these are much more powerful than dreams. I think most people have got the events pretty accurate. Um, and if they think about it longer and meditate on it, I think in time, when you talk to them down the road, they may have things they've added to it. It's not they're embellishing it, they're remembering. I think it's awakening them to, oh, that's what that meant. Oh, this is what I felt. This is so anyway. So yeah, but what it, the cobra represents a lot of things in religion, but in the East, it really represents the spiritual energy in the spine. And it's the it all the chakras, you know, kind of coming up. I think it's interesting that our medical symbol is the two snakes that twine around the center staff, like the spine with the the two kundalini snakes or whatever energy whatever you want to call it all about energy it's so, all about healing right yeah yeah and, and the greatest healing in the world happens in the spine it's a loving energy because right now i'm just to kind of wrap this thing up here right now i'm going around the world i'm on a three-year speaking tour i'm in year number two i've already been to india various places and i'm going back uh, all across the United States, not just in Hawaii, and, and now I'm going to uh, uh, England and, and you know all across Wales and Scotland, and then I'm, I'm going to Germany, all over Germany, and the Czech Republic and Switzerland and and Iceland, and then I'm going to uh, uh, India again, and I'm going to uh, the Middle East. Some of those countries in there, I got things going, and and then I'm going to be in the South Pacific and Asia. And, Japan and Singapore and places like that next year. So I'm going to travel till I'm 80. I'm 78 as of two days ago. I'm 78. At 80, I'm going to kind of pull back. Right now, I'm out there teaching people how to self-heal and trying to find people out there that want to do what I'm doing and learn what I'm doing. Because at 80, I want to have more hands-on with less people and give those people the empowerment to go farther and deeper than I've gone to give them what I've learned in my 80 years. So, cause I, I'm not gonna be around that. I've learned all these things and these techniques and these beautiful things from living in Hawaii and from going to India and from, you know, from all my experiences. And it'd be a shame to just pass away one day and I haven't passed on what I've learned. I don't care if they, ever mention my name if they're practicing what I'm my message is which is love forgiveness you know you got to love yourself that's what I'm teaching them you got to love yourself everything starts from loving yourself and then when you realize that God is you loving you is loving God and if you love you and you love God then everybody else is God too so you love them too and you love the rocks and the mountains and the trees and the dogs. Because everything is God. There's nothing that's not God. It's all one. So I'm trying to take people there. And, and I don't practice religious dogma. Whatever you want to believe in, it makes you happy. I'm happy for you. Do it. Enjoy it. Because the religion brings out, you know, the, the love in you to love God. And you want to see Jesus or you want to see whatever. You want to worship that. That's fine. It's beautiful. Great. But realize... That guy don't have any favorite chosen people because it's all him or what it's all energy. God is love. 
So love you first. And then that heals others. Say, want to heal others? Love you first. If people want to follow you on this journey and learn from you, or if they have questions for you, how can they find you? Well, they can go to my website, www.revbillmcdonald.com. They could go to uh, Facebook, which originally says Rev Bill McDonald, except I got a dot there, R-E-V period, Bill McDonald. They can find me there, and I got a couple of sites for that. They can find me, Rev Bill McDonald, on YouTube videos. There's another, I'm really inventive with names here. So, uh, or they can go on Amazon, and they can look up my books. I got a couple of books behind me there. You know, if you can see them there. Well, there you go. Two, two books up there. Uh, I got about six books out. I got books in German. I got books in uh, Spanish. I got one next year that's going to come out, I think, in Czechoslovakian uh, and some other languages. So they can find me a lot of different ways. I found if they look at my YouTube videos, I got like 190 something on my YouTube channel where I'm doing discussions and different subjects besides just this. Talk about a rainbow about experience, talking about uh, Babaji experiences, talking about no war, super miraculous things happening in the battle, uh, knowing who's going to die, who's going to get killed, who's going to get wounded, what airplanes are going to crash. I mean, I got stories there. Things happen all the time. And I got a new book coming out. Um, I still remember tomorrow, which is coming out next year. It's kind of a hopeful book. I still remember tomorrow, right? It was just, I don't play on a lot of things because I really do remember tomorrow. Why I walked in the room sometimes, I don't remember. But I remember, I know, I remember tomorrow. I know it's going to happen tomorrow. It's already happened. So tuning in on the past and the future, it's a matter of sliding down this frequency scale. You change your frequency, you change your dimension. Simple as that. You want to focus on now? Here we are, me and you are this now with all these other people. But it's all just us. It's all God. So it's all happening now. There's no other place for it to happen, but now past, present, future, it's all now. So anyway, that's how they can find me. I respond to emails. And if it's only, I love you, I send you a prayer. But if they got a major problem, I, I, I might recommend watching a video or, or reading something. But um, I get up at three or four in the morning to handle the email because it's crazy amount every day. But I'll be on the road. I'll be in Asia. I'll be in the Middle East. I'll be back across. I'll be back in New Mexico. I'll be back in Arizona. I'll be back in Southern California. I'll be up in Washington. I'll be back in Hawaii. I'll be back in Pennsylvania and New York again. I'll be back in Florida, Texas. So I'm out there. Uh, and I'm doing that so those people I saw in the clouds can find me. And they come. And when I have an audience, I have a group of 20, 30, 40, 50 people or 100 people or in India, 2,000 people, wherever I'm at, I see those faces there. Those people that were supposed to be there are there. So I don't worry about crowd size. Well, you know, I didn't do any advertising. I said, well, you know, if five people show up, that's okay. Those five people are supposed to be there. If everybody else shows up, that's good for them. But it's I'm there for those five or those 100 or those 20 or the dozen. But they're coming. I don't meet strangers anymore. It's it's there. So I'm continuing to do this. At 78 years old, uh, there's not that much sand left in the hourglass. I mean, I, I'm approaching the expiration date here eventually. So I'm trying to get things done as quickly as I can. That means I'm going out. I'm trying to find these people, give them the information. Then I'm trying to find those people that are in their 40s and 50s maybe if they're really mature 30s 20s early 30s they don't have enough life experience um, maybe later but i'm looking for people that are seekers self-nominated they, they want to do something they want to learn what i want to do they want to give they want to learn about how to teach people how to love and heal and all this stuff i'm looking for them because in two years I'm going to begin training sessions with them. And so only way I can really train them is have them 
experience time with me and spend spend time you know go someplace you know Mount Shasta or someplace and you know spend spend a week or two you know but I want to develop those people so when I'm gone what I've learned is still here and if those people follow what I'd like them to do when they're gone they've passed it on to another dozen people each so this thing keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and nobody has to say well Reverend Bill this was his idea there's no copyright there's no knowledge I have that's not that hasn't already been thought done did it's already on the spectrum there's it's all just going into the ASCIT record and pulling it out. I just put a bunch of stuff together from the Hawaiian training that I've had when I was with the Kahuna to my Indian training and what I've had experienced in, in, uh, in India in particular. I put all these focal points together because I'm teaching without dogma, without scripture, without all fancy mantras, all the under, you don't need all that. I just teach like, like a child would teach. It's just about love. Keep it simple, simple. So if people come to me, if you're looking for a college level, you know, you know, you want the meaning of this scripture and that and this God and this, that, then go someplace else. You come to me, you're gonna get childlike love. And I found as simple as that is, the more powerful it is. So that's my message. You're here to love, you're here to serve. You're here to love, that's rule number one. I love everybody. But rule number two, you don't have to like anybody. That's what people, they don't understand. You don't have to have abusive people around you. You don't have to have people that make you feel bad around you. You don't have to have people that treat you mean around you or abuse you. You got to love them. You don't have to tell them you love them. You got to love them, you know, that inner level. But you don't have to like what they do or like who they are. Whole different story. You got to love them because it's God. But you don't have to like the dark side. So if you learn that lesson, then you know there's a reason why birds of a feather flock together. You hang around people with higher vibration because they vibrate with you, like tuning forks. And as you evolve and your frequency evolves and changes, so will those people that you hang around with. That's why you don't have the same friends in your 20s and teens that you do in your 30s and 40s. You didn't make a, you didn't sit down and say, oh, I, uh, this year I'm not going to hang around. It just happens. You know, you don't want to go to the bar with them. You don't want to go to the football game with them. You don't want to go, you know, whatever it is. You just, you're busy. You're doing something different. You just drift away. That's why people change churches, religions change. They read different books. They have different ideas. It's all exploration. It's all an evolutionary process. If you're still thinking exactly the same way you did when you were 18, when you're 38 or 40, hang it up. You're stagnated. You're not going anywhere. You should wake up every day and go, you know, I was stupid yesterday. I mean, you should be willing to re-examine and examine anew everything in your life. Like I'm telling you all these things. Next year, you're, you're going to go, well, you know what? I got something else to add to that. I didn't realize this. That's growth. That's like somebody asked Einstein or somebody, there was somebody asked, some famous person. I, I saw the quote the other day. I thought, I, I got to remember that. Of course, I didn't remember. But the basis of the quote was, um, well, what if somebody some, comes to you someday and says that uh, uh, science doesn't support your religious beliefs? He says, well, I'll take a look at the religious beliefs. I'll take a look at science. And wherever the truth lies, that's what I'm going to follow. You know, well, Joe, yeah, okay, great. Oh, the, the earth rotates around the sun, not the other way around, because that's what they believe once upon a time, right? So if you aren't willing to change, you're in a constant state of denial and you never grow. And so right now, America and the world, we're in this stage of development where we're having growing pains. And as bad as it looks, and it looks awful, and the election looks like there'll be a revolution, everybody's mad at everybody. Don't go there. Don't buy into that. If that guy wants to hate somebody, this person wants to hate, uh, I don't like the way you're voting. I don't like the, you know, who cares? Love everybody. You don't have to like who they're voting for. You don't have to like their politics. You don't have to like their religion. But love them. Don't become part of the negative energy. 
So love everybody. Just love them. And the people that are really causing problems in the world, if you can't pray for them, then you've lost the whole meaning of the whole thing. You should be praying for them. You want them to succeed. You want them to change and evolve. You know? So how could you pray for this person? They're, they're doing all these terrible things. I said, I even didn't pray for Hitler if he was alive. Because if he could change him, he could change the lives of so many other people. You want him to evolve. It's all God. It's all one team. It's all one ocean. We're all swimming together. So I do believe that we come into life uh, as a part of a group. And this group of souls, whether they're your family, your enemies, your friends, the people that you've been with, they're not strangers. The same thousand or 10,000 or 5,000 or, or 200, I don't know what size, circles within circles. But these people will, will continue to, to come back into your life and lifetimes because you have all this interaction and karma with them. So your, your deal is as you change, as you evolve, you evolve even the lowest members of that group. So you owe it to the group to become the best and highest frequency you can become. Your frequency will change those around you. Don't condemn them. Change you, which will change them. You have a potent message of love that I appreciate you spreading. Thank you so much for that. And one last question real quick, because I know we got to get out of here, but through your experiences, not just your near-death experiences, but your mystical and spiritual experiences, are you afraid of death? I'm afraid of nothing. No, I mean that. Uh, there's things I'm uncomfortable with, like nobody likes rejection or be misunderstood, you know, or blame for something you didn't do. Well, that's human. But fear is the opposite of love. And everything is created in love. Well, that's contradictory, Bill. Like you just said, everything is love. And then you said there's hate and fear. You know, even that. It's all fears there to move you to love. It's just on the side of the coin. Everything eventually moves you to love. Because everything eventually is made out of love. No, I fear nothing. First off, there is no death. Uh, I have an ego. You have an ego. We believe our personal life stories. Therefore, we have a life story. We have an inus. And if we have an inus, we have a body of some kind. Human body, an astral body, a rainbow body, a body of light. You have something, an angel body. As long as you have an identity, you're separate from the source. And me and you talking, we're separate from the source. Because we. I believe I'm River Bill. You believe, you know, you're, you're Tia. So there you go. When you stop believing that story, then there is no more heaven or hell. There's no more reincarnation. There's no birth. There's no death. It's just God. It's just, when you dissolve it all down, there's only love. There is nothing else. There's only love. But see, if you don't have darkness, you don't know what light is. You don't have fear, it's hard to recognize what love is. So everything is like opposites when you're at this mind state. So you have opposites, dualities. But trying to find out world problems and solve spiritual problems and understanding what was the first day of God's life? You know, when was the beginning? You know, what you know, who made him, right? You go crazy with that. You're never going to solve that from a human mind. You have to be out of your friggin' mind, mindless. To even entertain that question. And in the mindless state, when you're one with everything, you don't even have that question. It's like, there's no question. It's just, you're one and you understand. There's only one. There's nothing else. Well, Rev Bill, thank you so much for joining me today. As always, you have been an absolute pleasure to be with. And I appreciate all of your wisdom and everything that you're doing traveling across the world to, to spread love and goodwill and uplifting stories of encouragement and positivity. That's what the world needs right now. Uh, if, they, if they go to my Facebook page and follow me, uh, I'll be posting 
I'm not very good at posting a schedule because my schedule just keeps growing and changing and crazy. But I do post, like I will be this next year, I will be in Pennsylvania. I will be in Florida. I will be in Texas. I will be in Arizona. I will be in New Mexico. I will be in Seattle. There's some places I will be. I just don't know when. So if they're out there and they, and they want to find me, come find me. And then eventually it'll reach a point where I'm saying I can't be everywhere. So join me on a Zoom, I'll have a live Zoom and say, come on, let's save everybody the, the trip here. Come on, let's just talk. There we go. So thank you for entertaining me with your questions and and uh, and letting, allowing me to uh, share. Because uh, being a good Irishman, I do like to share a story or two. And you're good at it. Thank you, Reverend. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you being here and supporting my channel. If you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing if you enjoy near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative stories. It helps the algorithm know that this information is useful and push it out to more people. And that's the goal to get as many people to know that we are eternal spiritual beings and that we never die. Our bodies might die, but our essence will never die. And I want people to live with less fear. Let's all spread the word, like, comment, subscribe, share, hit that little notification bell so you get all the notifications when my videos post. Thank you for all of your support. I'm sending love to you.